session going. Um, welcome to everyone. Happy end of June. I cannot believe it is almost the beginning of July. It is hot here in Durham, North Carolina, where I live. I'm Whitney. Hello. Um, I go by Whitney or Wit. I've been teaching for Manhattan Prep for a really long time at this point. I teach the GRE and the GMAT. Um, and I love these sessions. If you've watched any of the other ones, you know how much I love these sessions. Um, they give us a chance to teach like really deeply into topics that we don't have time typically in our courses um, or maybe in our even in our one on one sessions with students. So um, we get this like great opportunity to teach things that we love or things that we think maybe get skipped over too often. Um, and so I am excited about this session today. I will warn you, it is going to be on the difficult side. So we're going to be dealing with some of the harder topics. We are focusing on quant and we are focusing on quantitative comparisons the choose from one quantity, which is bigger, A or B. So we're going to start with just a very quick, like, here's what a QC problem looks like on the GRE. Um, that said, if you would like a deeper exploration of quantitative comparisons, then definitely check out our many episodes of our free prep hour, where we do cover a lot more detail in the like intro to QC and beginner techniques of QC. Um, so plenty of those in our, our menu, you can like search for <laughs> on our playlist. Um, and this one will be up on YouTube. You may be finding it on YouTube already, but for those of you live, this will be up on YouTube, too sweet. And so you'll be able to come back and review this one as well. So we're gonna focus on quantitative comparisons. We're gonna look at a very specific content area. And so we're gonna look at the weirdness around inequalities and absolute values. And inequalities and absolute values often get paired together and they often show up in the world of QC. So like what better way to do it than to do them all together? Yeah. So we are gonna get started. Let me go ahead and share my screen so you can see what we're gonna be working on. Just as a friendly reminder, everything that we cover is coming out of our Jerry Five Pound book. And so that is available. You can get it from us directly. You can get it from Amazon, right? Ebooks, paper books, if you're like me and like the physical books. Uh, but let's get started with a quick intro to QC. So I'm going to put a QC question up on the screen, right? If you have any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat window. Um, if you have questions about something that you'd like to discuss, you know, after this topic, feel free to throw that in the Q&A bar. Um, this, my friends, is a QC problem. And a QC problem will always consist of at least two things. One will be the quantities themselves. So it'll be quantity A and quantity B. And you'll always have the same four answer choices. Now you may or may not, in this case we have not, but you may or may not be given some information upfront that will apply to both quantities. It's sort of like big picture situational information. But for now, we just have two quantities. And it seems kind of easy enough. Our job is to decide which of these two quantities is larger. And so I would like for y'all to pull in. Which do you think is larger? Is it quantity A, at which point you'd pick A? Is it quantity B, therefore you pick B? C, if you know that they're equal. And D, if, who knows, we're not quite sure. Um, and then there is no E. <laughs> right? So there is no E. I guess you could use E if you're like, what? I'm, to I'm totally lost. Or conscientious objector, right? You decide you just don't want to answer. Uh, our standard time for a QC problem is going to be in the neighborhood about a minute 15. And I'm currently looking at a pretty big split between answers B and D with about 90% of the vote in. Okay, B and D. Got a little bit of a mix around A, C, and E as well. I do have, in fact, a conscientious objector. <laughs> all right, so I've got almost all the vote in on the poll. Almost all the vote in. And yeah, so we're looking at about a two to three split of B versus D couple of things about QC. And so we're going to go through this process as we work on each one. But QC has essentially three different steps. Well, we'll even just call it two steps. But the first step, the upfront step, 
right? Like step zero, if you will, is for me just to take a moment and have what I'd call like a first glance. And that's just like, what do I see? Um, questions that I might be asking myself at this point. Is there upfront info? Right, like, is everything, you know, given in numbers or in words? Are there pictures? Um, and again, if you've got a, a question where you've got your hand raised, send it to me in the chat window, right? As opposed to a hand raised. It'll be much easier if I can find it. If you can send it to me directly, that'd be perfect. Um, so is there upfront information? Are there any given pictures? Um, are there any keywords? Is it all words? It, uh, are there just numbers? Does anything jump out at me? Some other things we'll eventually start to see are the quantities similar? Are they very different? Are they very different? And then one big one is, is quantity B very simple? Like just a single number. We're not gonna see much of this today, but it is something to pay attention to. Um, if you are looking for some additional techniques for QC, uh, some of the concepts that we work on are things like cheat off of B or the hidden inequality or more effective ways of testing out numbers or picking numbers. Um, all of those are, again, in some of our awesome free prep R videos. So we've got those two. All right, so let's get to the other two big steps that we'll be doing today. Step one, can I simplify? So the steps I like to follow in QC aren't so much like directive as they are questions. So I don't know, can I simplify? And there are three places that I can simplify the information. If it was given to me, I could simplify upfront info. I might be able to simplify within a quantity and I might be able to simplify across quantity, quantities, right? Meaning maybe I can exchange some terms. Maybe I can just simplify terms under one side. Maybe there's a lot up front that's gonna need work. We're gonna see a lot tonight of upfront, little bit of within and across, but a lot of upfront. Once I've tried to simplify, well, in this case, I've got no upfront information. Everything's a variable. There's no upfront information to simplify. I can't really make X more simple than it is, nor can I make X squared more simple than it is. So everything's kind of stuck. So my step two is pick numbers. Can I, or should I, do I need to pick numbers, right? So that's gonna be kind of my next, my next step here. Do I need to pick numbers? And so we keep some things in mind when we pick numbers. Our job, is to try and prove D, which means we're gonna prove that we don't know, right? I'm gonna try and prove that the relationship can't be determined. So some of what I need to be thinking about is I need to think about the types of numbers that I'll pick so that I can try and push this prove D. Right? So the numbers we'll typically choose, we go through the anagram zone, F or acronym, I guess I'm making up words over here. So zone F is zero, one, negatives, extremes, and fractions. So these are the types of numbers that we want to remember because weird stuff happens around zeros, happens around negatives and extremes, one, fraction, so on. So our goal is to find two different relationships between the two quantities. If we fail, pick three and then guess. So what I mean is like test out three numbers, pick three numbers. If I keep failing to find different relationships, I keep getting the same relationship over and over again, I'm gonna do that three times and I'm gonna guess. Um, in that same vein, I will be looking for uh, patterns in the process. So let's do this here. A lot of folks said that B was bigger. A lot of folks said that B was bigger, um, which it would appear like it would be because when I square stuff, often it gets bigger, but not always, right? Like often is not always. So if we keep in mind our little prove D and pick numbers, I might start with something like X is zero or one. 
as soon as I do that, I immediately see a break in the relationship that B is bigger. In fact, when X is zero or X is one, the two quantities are equal. I will write the symbol between the two sides. So I'm gonna start using like an equation symbol or inequality symbols. So I have one relationship where they're equal, right? Zero is an integer. Positive numbers are integers, negative numbers are integers, and zero is an integer. Not too far off topic, but it is an integer. So now I just need to show one other relationship, right? I only need to show one other relationship. And so let's say I pick X is two, right? Just something kind of all like easy that comes to mind. Um, X itself would be two. Once I squared, it becomes four. That means that this one is bigger. I now have a result where quantity B is bigger. I have two different relationships. And so the correct answer has to be D, it cannot be determined. It cannot be determined. Okay, so just for funsies, let's just try one more. What would I get if I had the expression? Here we go, I'll put some new numbers under here for us. Let's say we're gonna do X and X plus two, right? And now let's do it, try again, let's pull in. Right, I've got a, about 85% of the vote in, coming in right at a minute. I have some more folks picking D again, but I have more people moving over towards B, quantity B is bigger. So we can try out some of our values, no upfront, nothing really to be simplified. So I could say, let's imagine X is zero. If X is zero, this is zero, this is two, that makes quantity B bigger. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. We're just, I'm just getting general poll for the moment. No, it's totally fine. Um, let's say I decided to pick one. If X is one, I'm going through my zone F, right? So if X is one, quantity A is one, quantity B is three, that's still bigger. Hmm, let me try fraction. Maybe something negative, like X is negative 50. Let's try something like really far out there, right? Uh, and the options are exactly the same as before. Thank you for that. So X is negative 50. If I add two at it, it's negative 48. Ooh, okay, so that's still bigger. You know, I'm still getting the same thing. If I try a fraction, X is, let's call it negative a half. This is negative one half. If I add two to that, it's positive one and a half. That's still bigger. You know, what? I've tried more than enough at this point, right? More than enough at this point. I'm going to go ahead and select B, that B is bigger. Okay, so all of that said, all of that said that B is bigger, is there a way that we could have maybe proven it without all of that testing? So I do want to introduce one advanced technique that might be useful. So above and beyond all of this is the concept that for QC, our goal is to compare, don't compute. And that's not always possible. <laughs> Sometimes we're going to be computing things. But if we have our way, often we will be able to move through the thing by comparing the two quantities more than actually like computing things. So how could I compare? So there's one technique that we are going to employ tonight, and it's the technique of hidden inequality, because we're talking about inequalities. So the idea of a hidden inequality 
is that my job on QC is to figure out the relationship between these two sides. Are they equal? Is quantity A bigger? Or is it the quantity B is bigger? Or is it that I have no idea? Can't tell. So great question. Little side note about the world of inequalities, which we're gonna run into for inequalities, period. I know this is gonna be a thing that we will have to deal with here momentarily with all inequalities is that there are some exceptions to what I'm allowed to do in an inequality. So for example, imagine I have the inequality negative W uh, plus three is greater than five. Oh, the question was asking if I could factor out of this. Yeah. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna play with it in a second. All right, so if I'm trying to solve this inequality, that negative W plus three is greater than five. Type to me in the chat window, what is the solution? What do you get when you try to solve for W? What do you get when you solve for W? And there should be an inequality symbol in there. Nice. So a lot of what I'm seeing coming in is let's subtract a three from both sides, just like we were gonna solve a normal equation. So I get negative W is greater than two. But if I want to get rid of the negative on W, if this were an equation, negative W equals two, it wouldn't matter. I would just divide both sides by a negative and say W equals negative two. Problem is, is that with an inequality symbol, when we start moving negative things around, our sign has to flip, okay? So if I want to divide both sides by negative one, then in order to do so, I have to flip my inequalities. I have to flip my inequalities. That's the one thing we have to know about solving inequalities multiplying or dividing by a negative flips my sign. Okay. So if we're going to use a technique called the hidden inequality, then we're going to have to think about inequality rules while we do it. So the hidden inequality basically says that if we pretend that quantities A and B are two sides of an inequality, just like you know, W less than two or less than negative two, W would be like quantity A in this case, negative two would be like quantity B. So we're imagining quantity A and quantity B as two sides of a, a possible inequality. Now it might be the case that once we do a little research, we find out that the sign that should live here is actually an equal sign. Maybe we do a little bit of research and we find out that the sign that needs to live here is a less than sign. Or maybe we start to scratch away at it and we realize that a lot of different signs could live under there. And so it isn't just one. Sign. So in the world of a hidden inequality, we can do anything to both sides of the inequality as long as we don't multiply or divide by a negative thing or thing that could be negative. So we can do anything to both sides, or in this case, to both quantities. I can do whatever I want to both quantities. I can double both of them. I can cut both of them in half. I can add 50 to both of them. I can subtract five from both of them. I can do anything I want as long as I don't multiply or divide by a negative. So what this does is it gets me thinking about any common terms. Like, are there any terms that are in both sides of this quantity 
that maybe I could add or subtract from both sides. What do y'all think? Yes, we have an X on both sides. I love that we have an X on both sides. So if I want, you know what, I can subtract just like in, you know, any kind of other algebra, I can subtract that X from both sides. That leaves me with nothing left under quantity A and two remaining under quantity B. Well, now it's pretty easy to tell which of these two sides is bigger. Two is always bigger than zero. And so quantity B is bigger. So we might use this technique as we start to move through some questions, allowing us to move things from one side of our quantities to the other. All right, so I'm gonna leave all of this up. We are going to finally try one. So our rules. First, we're gonna take a step back. We're just gonna kind of like big picture look. Is there any upfront information? What do the quantities look like? Then I'm gonna leave all these set, steps there. Then, ah, right. So uh, I had a, a great question in the background before we go to that. Let me address what they're saying and then we'll go back to this. Yes, in this case, it might seem tempting to divide both sides by X, which would leave one and X. However, was I allowed to divide by X? And you can type this to panelists or panelists and attendees. Am I allowed to divide by X? No, I am not allowed to divide by X, partly because it can't be negative, right? Like that's a, it could be negative, which I've already said, I'm not allowed to multiply or divide by a negative thing, right? Can't do it. That said, it could also be zero and I'm never allowed to divide by zero. Never, never, never. So what I normally encourage people to do is if you're working with a variable, at least to start, only add or subtract it. Just start by adding or subtracting it. We'll see some you know, potentially more complex versions where you can do more than that, but at least initially, add or subtract it. You can multiply, divide, add or subtract any numbers that you know for sure are positive. No, for sure. Great question, by the way, y'all. Great question. Okay, so this is what we're gonna be looking for. I wanna know, is there upfront information? Um, can I simplify that upfront information? Can I simplify the quantities themselves? Can I maybe move some stuff across the quantity? Once I've done all that, do I need to start picking numbers? So we are going to do another one. Take a moment, take a deep breath. All right, here you go. Pull in as you have the answer. All right, about a minute and a half in, I've got about 60% of the vote, kind of a mixed bag. So first glance, I definitely have upfront information. 
And I'm going to leave this poll running. So you're welcome to change your thoughts as we work. So there is upfront information. The quantities seem pretty simple. Quantity B is a very specific single number. Um, can I simplify? Yeah, I sure can. I'm going to start there. Let's simplify our inequality at the top by grouping like terms. So I'll start by subtracting a 4y from both sides. So 3y minus 3 is going to be less than or equal to 9. And then I'm going to add a 3 to both sides. Watch your math. So I'll get 3y is less than or equal to 9 plus 3 is 12, uh, which gives me the value of y being less than or equal to 4. Well, if I were to think of my symbols that would go between these two quantities, it could be y is less than 4. You know, y could be 0 or 1 or you know, negative 20. But according to this little line right there, y could also be equal. And so if I can get two different results, any two results, exactly. So one of the things I want you to see is that when we look at these solutions down here, A through C are reserved for always. Quantity A is always bigger. No matter what the numbers we pick, quantity A is always bigger. Quantity B is always bigger. No matter what number we pick, quantity B is always bigger. C, the two quantities are always equal. No matter which one, you know, no matter what number we pick, they're always equal. So anytime I can show more than one, I have to pick D. Anytime I have to pick more than one, I have to pick D. So right now I have that Y could be less than four. Y could be equal to four. So change your answer in the poll if you haven't already. What is the correct answer now? What is the correct answer? Cool, 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 cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right, let's try it again. Yeah, let's do another. Feeling pretty good about these. We'll introduce a little absolute value this time. So the absolute value of a number Right, so like the absolute value of, so if I were to put the absolute value of A, if that equals six, then it's either the case that A was a positive number, and so it equals six, or A was a negative number, and so the absolute value was changing the sign, and in that case, negative a is equal to six or a is equal to negative six. Okay, so that's how we'd solve an absolute value. Absolute value is this idea of like how far away from zero something is um, or absolute value is what happens when we strip the number of its sign. Okay, so let's try another one, take a breath. All right, enjoy. All right, so upfront information, we can definitely simplify. I'm going to do something a little formal 
And I did it for the example absolute value. But the reason why I'm going to do it is because as long as we do absolute value formally, then it doesn't matter if the absolute value is in an equation like it is here, or if we start getting into harder and harder problems where the absolute value is inside of an inequality. Um, so the first thing I'll do is isolate that absolute value. That's kind of our first move all the time is to try and isolate it. So absolute value of x minus 4 is equal to 16 thirds. Equal to 16 thirds. Honestly, absolute value is just that. It's that once you put absolute value symbols on something, if the thing is positive, the absolute value doesn't matter. So absolute value of 2 is just going to be 2. However, absolute value of negative 2 is essentially saying we're going to manually turn this negative 2 positive. So when I take the absolute value of a plus or a minus, I'm going to get the same answer. The technical definition of an absolute value, the absolute value of some number, is going to be equal to the square root of that number squared. So basically, you square it to make sure it's positive, and then you take the square root to get back to the positive root. OK, so in order to figure out this absolute value, I'm going to have two scenarios. I have the scenario where x minus 4 is positive. Right? And if x minus 4 is positive, then the absolute value symbols aren't doing anything. So I can just throw them away. So x minus 4 equals 16 thirds, or x equals 16 thirds plus 4, which is the same as 12 thirds, which means in one scenario, x could equal 28 thirds. So I have a situation where the two quantities could be equal. However, if x minus 4 was a negative number, then in order to strip the absolute value symbols, I need to sort of like manually unnegative those things. Now, we could go do a bunch of work. We could. But here's what I know. x minus 4 equals negative 16 thirds. I'm going to stop right now because I'm going to add a four to the other side, just like I did before. Positive 16 thirds plus 12 thirds is not going to be the same as negative 16 thirds plus 12 thirds. These two, this X is not going to be equal to 28 thirds. I can stop. My job is just to compare. I don't care if in this universe X is bigger than 28 thirds or smaller than 28 thirds. I just know that it's going to be different. Yep, because 4 over 1, or 4, is the same as 12 thirds, so that I could have a common denominator. Yep, and the negative in front of this parentheses got divided on both sides. So I divided both sides by a negative 1. And so the negative is on the right-hand side. Of course, told you this one was going to be a bit of a challenge lesson, right? So a lot of concepts, a lot of concepts. Absolute value inequalities, not the easiest game in town, <laughs> not the easiest game in town. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to try it again. Some more opportunities to simplify in inequalities, simplify in absolute values and so on. So here we go. Let's give this one a try. Take a deep breath. All right, there you go.
All right. So let's take a look at our upfront information. We have two inequalities, so we should do a little bit of work to simplify with those first. So we'll start with the first one. Since it's um, involving x, well, I'll throw this over here on the left-hand side. So we'll start with this 3x. So 3 times x minus 7 is greater than or equal to 9. So I'm going to divide both sides by 3. Just go ahead and knock that out first. So x minus 7 is greater than or equal to 3. Add a 7 to both sides. So x is greater than or equal to 10. So that's what I know. I know x is a number that's greater than or equal to 10. Now let's look at why. Um, I don't like a decimal. And so I will often multiply things through to get rid of decimals. In this case, you could multiply by 100 to move the decimal point. But I know that 0.25 if I just multiply that by four, it becomes one. So I'm gonna multiply everything in this inequality by four. So I get one Y minus 12 is less than or equal to four. So Y is less than or equal when I add a 12 to both sides, I add a 12 to both sides, I'm gonna get Y is less than or equal to 16. Okay, well, I've simplified. I know that X has to be greater than or equal to 10. So it's gonna be 10, or greater, just note to myself, and y has to be 16 or under. So I'm gonna have to pick some numbers. That's not enough to give me my answer. Well, what I know is as long as x has to be bigger than 10 and y has to be smaller than 16, they could be equal. I could make them both like 12 or something. <laughs> so I could let x equal 12, y equal 12, and I could make them equal. But I could certainly make them the ends of their ranges, like X could be 10 if I wanted, and Y could be 16, at which point Y would now be the bigger number. I get two different solutions, and so the answer has to be D. Starting to see a lot of D. <laughs> nice, but very nice. The answer has to be D. So we want to make sure and move through carefully when we're simplifying upfront information. All right, let's play with another absolute value. This one's a little tricky. This one's a little tricky. So take a deep breath. If they were the exact same inequality, it would still be D. Mm -hmm. Or if the inequality symbols had gone the other direction, right? If we had been told that X was less than or equal to 10 and Y was greater than or equal to 14, then all the values of y would have been bigger than all the values of x. So if those inequality symbols had been switched, then we'd be in a case where we'd actually have quantity b would be the correct answer. All right, here we go. Here comes your next problem. Enjoy.
I'm going to let the time run a little bit longer because this is definitely more involved to work on because now we're starting to layer absolute value and inequality. So this is where it becomes even more essential that I think about the two different scenarios. So I need to think about what happens if the stuff in here is positive versus what happens if the stuff in here is negative. Okay. So if the stuff in here is positive, if everything that's sitting in this thing is positive, let's just kind of think about that for a second. Then three plus three X is gonna be less than negative two X. If the stuff in here is negative, then negative three plus three X is less than negative two X. So I'll start with the one on the left-hand side. I'm going to subtract a three from both sides. So three X is less than minus two X minus three. And then I'm gonna add a two X to both sides. So five X is less than minus three. And so in this case, X has to be less than negative three. Oh, excuse me, negative three fifths. Negative three fifths. However, if what was in there was already negative, I need to manually make it negative. I'm going to go ahead and divide everything through by a negative, and that's going to flip my sign. So three plus three x is greater than two x. I'll subtract a two x from both sides. So three plus uh, x, three x minus two x is just x is greater than zero and then subtract a three from both sides. So X has to be greater than negative three. All right, so let's map this. If I were to look at a number line, I'll put it up here. My number line for X has to be bigger than negative three, but smaller than negative three fifths. And so like zero is up here, All right? So this is gonna be my range of values for X. I'm ready to take that into my two quantities now. Now quantity B is just four, which is so nice. It's just a nice, simple, easy number four. If I want the absolute value of a number, this is where a number line can be really lovely. Let's imagine that the number is, here's my zero. And I know that a number is between one and four. If I take the absolute value of that number, it's not gonna change. It's gonna stay between one and four. However, if I have a number line and what's on that is negative. So now let me go negative one to negative four. If I know the number is between negative one and negative four, the absolute value of that number is going to be this range up here again. It will flip it over to the positive side. So if I take this number line and I say, okay, currently the value of X is down here. This is X in this range. then the absolute value of X is going to be on the positive of that same range. So not negative three fifths, positive three fifths to positive three. What does this mean? It means that no matter what value absolute or X takes or absolute value takes from as small as three fifths to as big as three, every one of those will be smaller than four. And so we finally have our first B. Um, why did I not subtract three X and then make it negative? No reason. I just kept it positive, but very easily could have left this as three 
plus 3x is less than minus 2x. I could have subtracted a 3x from both sides. So 3 is less than negative 5x. Divide both sides by negative 5. My sign flips to negative 3 fifths. Notice it's the exact same. x is less than negative 3 fifths. It's just written in the other. Um, because I didn't, sub I, I could have done the same thing here. It literally would have done the exact same thing that I just did on this one. You would have had three is greater than negative X or X is greater than negative three. Exactly the same. Yep, for sure, of course. For sure, so the beauty of the inequality is that I have to flip my sign, but as long as I flip my sign, it doesn't matter which order I go. Like I could subtract things first, I could subtract the other thing to the other side, totally fine. Your call, whatever you're up to. So inequalities, great on a number line. Absolute values, great on a number line. Okay, so sometimes we get into the world where what's actually happening is not just inequalities, but sometimes a little bit of like positives and negatives as well. Like, what does it mean? Does it mean to be positive or negative? So let's try this one. I will relaunch your poll and enjoy. Correct. We cannot assume integer. I had a great question in the chat window. We cannot. We never want to assume integer. All right, so we've got about half of our votes in. Yeah, these are getting a little trickier, right? A little trickier. So what do I know? I know y is a positive number. Hmm. I know y is going to be something positive. X, well, if the absolute value of x is less than 1, if we have a really simple inequality or what sits inside of this is just like a single number. Then a really elegant way of visualizing it is to see it as this little number line where once you've done the solution for it, right? I know that X is either less than one or negative X is less than one, which means X is greater than negative one. I know that X is going to be on this little number line somewhere between and strictly between one and negative one. OK, 
Okay, so let's imagine the easiest example where X is zero. Let's just plug a number in really quickly. If X is zero, then quantity B immediately becomes zero. Quantity A is zero plus whatever positive number we want to make Y. It could be anything, one, two, a thousand. And so we'll just call it, you know, one plus five or something. So we know for a fact that we have a case where quantity A is bigger. I don't know, we'll say this is like Y is five or something, right? So we have a case where we know that quantity A is bigger. My job now, right, if we come all the way back over here, is to find two different relationships. Find two different relationships. So what I'd like is to think, let's not pick X is zero. Let's pick something else, right? So what if X is a half, right? We'll pick a fraction. What if X is a half and let's let Y equal, I don't know, five again and see what happens. <laughs> let's see what happens. So what happens is that X is that one half plus five is 5.5. .5. But over here, this is one half times five. That's two point, well, crikey. Okay, that one's bigger again. Ugh. What do I need to do? If I want to try and make quantity A smaller, what would I need to do? Is there anything I could do? Yeah, I love this idea. So Rose says in the chat, we know a negative number maybe. Yeah, what if I try X is negative one half and y is whatever five well then this becomes one half plus five again this is 5.5 .5. but this one becomes negative two point uh oh uh oh <laughs> right, right. okay so what is happening? I keep getting the same thing. This is a place where honestly, if I keep getting the same thing, I said, we're going to try, we're going to think creatively, but if we keep getting stalled out, we're just going to go ahead and pick, right? Like quantity A, we're just going to go for it. So let's think about what is happening here. Why is always, and like I said, we're looking for patterns if possible. So let me get all this stuff out of the way for us for a moment. Y is a positive number. And X could be either positive, negative, or zero. Right? So when X is zero, this quantity is Y and this quantity is zero, which Y is always bigger than zero. You know that part. When X is negative, so when X is between zero and negative one. What's true about quantity B? When X is between negative one and zero, so not equal to zero. Yeah, quantity B is always going to be a negative number. Always. Quantity A, however, will always, no matter what, be a positive number because X is always going to be positive or zero and Y is always going to be positive. So the very smallest that A could possibly be is Y. Otherwise, it's just going to get bigger than Y. So quantity A is always going to be positive. So in the world where X is smaller than zero, quantity A is always going to be bigger again. So our only area that we can hope for things is if X is bigger than zero. And again, what I've said already is if you keep getting the same answer three times and you've picked weird stuff, stick with it. But this is always going to be Y plus something. Y plus, not a big something, but Y plus something. Over here, I'm gonna take Y and I'm always going to be multiplying it by a number that's smaller than one, which means what is happening to Y? If I multiply Y by a number like 0.1 or 0.2 or 0.45 or 0.7 or 0.9 or 0.99999, what happens to a number when I multiply it by a fraction? 
Yes, it gets smaller. So what's happening over on this side is that I'm always getting a value that is smaller than Y by at least some amount. Right? Point nine, 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 nine times Y is only a tiny bit smaller than Y, but it is still smaller. Point zero, 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 one times Y, I made X really, really small, really close to zero, is gonna be a tiny number. So on the left-hand side, I always get Y or bigger. On the right-hand side, quantity B, I always get less than Y which means in all cases, quantity A is always gonna be bigger. So tricky. So, so we wanna to start to think about, okay, I'm looking for patterns in these. Let's try one more. Yeah, a little mix, a little mixy of them. Okay. I will reset the poll. Mmm, definitely making things a little harder. I am still not quite at half of the vote. Still missing votes from 30 people, 35 people, a two and a half in. Slowly answers are coming in. So a big thing to look for is information like greater than zero that might imply that we can use some positives and negatives if we think about absolute value as distance from zero so if the absolute value of x is less than one what that really means is that x is no more than one away from zero Right. The distance from X to zero is less than one. Less than one. Okay, so what does that mean then? We can use that trick on this first pair of numbers. What we know is that if the absolute value of X is greater than the absolute value of Y, then x wherever it is i don't know where it is positive or negative x is going to be 
further away from zero than y is. So that's what this first one tells me, is that x is further away from zero than y is. But I don't know in which direction. OK, so this is the first piece of information. X is further away on a number line from 0 than Y is. What does it mean if the sum of two numbers is greater than 0? So again, let's think like patterns or number lines. In order for the sum of two numbers to be greater than 0, what has to be true? Yeah, the sum is going to be positive. Yeah, OK. So in order for the sum to be positive, they're either both positive. So now let's look through the scenarios. Here are our scenarios. So it could be the case that x and y are both on this positive side of the number line. That's one scenario, because their sum would be a positive number. Which one's bigger? Quantity B. Right? X is going to be bigger. They can't both be negative, so that one's out. But let's see about making one of them positive. Now, in order for them to be positive, y'all kept saying to me that the positive one had to be more positive. So if I were to look at my little numbers up here and I made Y the positive one, but X the negative one, X is gonna be more negative than Y, which means that's not gonna work. So it means that in this case, I need X to be the positive one. Y is allowed to be negative because it's less negative than Y is positive. And once again, X is bigger. And so it can't be either other case. X and Y can't be the same. And it can't be the case that they're both negative, which would let Y be bigger, or right, that Y is the positive one while X is the negative one. Quantity B is bigger again. So when we're doing this world of like inequalities, and absolute values, and then mixtures of inequalities and absolute values. We are looking for patterns. We are looking for ways of mapping so that we can visually see, right? Often these are going to take more time as you've seen, right? So as you're working on a quant section, several people ask, right? You'll have two math sections that will be counted. You might have a third one as an experimental. If you're not sure of the format of the GRE, We've got a couple of really great free prep hours um, also on our YouTube channel um, that go over the like main overview of the entire test. But we've also got like intro to QC and intro to quant that'll show you how the quant sections look. Each quant section of the two, three, if you get the experimental, has about seven QC questions. And then the other 13 or so questions are what we call DQ, multiple choice. So, you know, choose all that apply, fill in the blank. And it's Jerry Free Prep Hour. That's our YouTube just name, the same thing as this one. It's, it's our free prep hour. Um, but what we've got, right, is with those six or seven questions of QC, if you start to run into some that look like this and that might be a little puzzly, it's worth deciding. If you know that this is kind of a question that usually takes you a little longer, is this something that you want to do on your first pass through? Or is this the type of question that you want? to just guess something, flag, and come back when you know you have a little more time. Because often these look very straightforward and they look like algebra, but as you've seen, there's a lot of puzzling that goes into them that can easily take us more like two, two plus minutes. And if our target for QC is like a minute 15, minute 20, we wanna be really careful spending a lot of time on these upfront. We wanna make sure that we move through and um, look at other question types before Right. We spend all of our time on these handful. So just as a reminder, all of our 
um, free prep hours are online. So I'll pull up the website for you so you can see our GRE free prep hours. Um, and they're awesome. Ooh, see, they're popping up already. And so I'll get you our full line of lessons, right? And you, there's a ton. If you just go to our MPREP GRE site, even, um, you can find so much stuff there. Like we got a couple of channels of vocabulary. We've got um, several channels. Let me pull this up for you. Here we go. And then if you come to our, here it is. This is our YouTube site. Let me send this out to everyone. There we go. That'll take you to all of our pages. But if you want just to see our free prep hour, if you didn't find us by coming to a free prep hour, that second list is the playlist of all of our free prep hour stuff. By like at this point, we have over 75, almost 80 hours worth of material on our two different vocab based pages. So we've got Jerry vocab word of the day. We've got two full playlists. Each one of those has a few hundred vocabulary words. So we've got tons and tons of materials that you can use. And as if that's not enough, we've got all kinds of free stuff on our site. So if you have not signed up for the free resources on our site, absolutely do. It's not just a free practice test, but you can also sign up for a free trial of our Interact product. You can also sign up to attend any of our live classes for free, our first sessions. So you can come and try out any session one of our full course anytime you want. If you're not sure between GRE and GMAT, maybe you're one of our business school applicants, um, you can try all of the same free things on the GMAT side as well. And we have a GMAT free prep hour uh, video series as well. So we've got all kinds of stuff available to help you study, to help you get prepared. And then we will be back here again with more free prep hours anytime you need them. I have a few questions in the Q&A. Um, so I just wanted to kind of answer those briefly before we call it an evening. Um, but there is a writing section. It's two essays. Um, the GRE has two quant, two verbal, two essays, and then one experimental that'll be either quant or verbal. Um, if you've already taken the GMAT, you'll want to take a free practice GRE either on our site or one of the official power prep ones, and then just see how far off you are from your goal. It's like, is there a recommended amount of time to study? It really does depend on, uh, it might just be that you need to work on vocab because often the quant side of GRE is a little easier and you get a calculator. So you might find that you really just need to do a little bit more vocab work if you're transitioning from the GMAT. There are a few math topics like geometry that show up more frequently on the GRE. So maybe you do need to spend a little bit more time with those. But I think usually the big transition is vocab and then understanding the QC question types. Um, best way to learn or study vocab, flashcards, 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 flashcards. And the flashcards that you make yourself are by far and away the best. I know that there are quite a few other great ones. We've got um, two big full stacks of them um, on the site. Uh, we've got our own apps for those, but there are a bunch of other ones as well. So lots of good vocab um, apps that you could use flashcards. I love our word of the day videos and making your own flashcards. Um, for Jerry at home, you get a whiteboard. So no scratch paper. You have to use a, a, a qualifying whiteboard of the size. You'll need to check their site because I don't want to say anything in case they change it or update it from the time that this video is recorded. But always check their site for the dimensions available for the whiteboard. Um, we do not have any materials for subject GRE, just for the general GRE. Mm -hmm. um, and our next free prep session, we've got a couple a month. So um, I'm not entirely sure. Let me uh, check our site. Typically our free programs, like anything that you want for free um, is going to show up on our site. This is our GRE site. There you go right there. Um, and so if you would like to attend any of our free stuff, typically you just need to, here we go. I was looking for free classes, free events. Here are the upcoming free prep hours. Um, and so we've got several, the one that you're sitting in with me right now. There's another one on the 14th. I'll have another one on the 25th of July, so 14th and 25th. And then we'll have two more in August on the 9th and the 26th. 
we'd love to have you join for any and all of those. And don't forget the, I think we've got 73 or 74 of them already up on our YouTube site. So lots and lots and lots to cover. <laughs> um, best time to write the GRE is when you're ready. <laughs> I know that's a terrible answer to that question, but there is no good time of the day or time of the year. Uh, it's just when you're ready. Um, and no, the five pound book is not a combination of individual subject. The what used to be the old subject Manhattan prep books are now the quant and verbal strategy guides. They've been consolidated into two big books. The five pound book is an entirely new, I mean, when we wrote it, it's all new questions just for the five pound book. Yep. yep. Um, let's see, let me answer one more, two more. Uh, oh, and that's all of them. I think that's all the ones I've got. I don't see any other ones. Yay! Not yay, you're welcome to ask more, but just to make sure. Um, thanks so much to all of you. Happy, happy summer here in uh, the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> we are full blown in the summer, yeah? Um, you, you mean graduate school applications? You certainly can start your applications at any point in time, absolutely, before you write your GRE. Mm -hmm. Um, often students like to get their GREs done in and around the same time, just so they have a sense of what they need to talk about on their applications. All right, friends, have a wonderful rest of your afternoon, evening, morning, for those of you that are a lot further east of me. Um, again, my name is Whitney. It's been a pleasure to get to work with you this evening. Uh, let us know if we can be of any help in your journey, and we will talk to you soon.